Jesse, are you ready for some rapid fire? I am ready for some rapid fire. We have talked a lot, and now it's time <laughs> to, to talk fire some away. More. That's right. So, all right. So double fill in the blank. It's blank that Chris Tyree has been referred to as a cheat code, and blank that Irish receivers coach Chancey Stuckey says freshman Braylon James is freakish. So it's uh, exciting that Chris Tyree has been referred to as a cheat code, and it's optimistic that Chancey Stuckey says freshman Braylon James is freakish. And why it's exciting, because I think it's just going to open up Notre Dame's offense so much. Chris Tyree, you know, having a guy with that kind of speed in the slot, uh, him being able to take the top off the defense and kind of open up some more underneath routes for Notre Dame's bigger body wide receivers, um, Deion Colsey, uh, Jaden Thomas, like that's only going to help out their game. It's going to help out Sam Hartman's game. Um, so I, I think that that's so exciting in terms of what the, what he can do uh, to open up the pass game. And then when you talk about Braylon James and his, you know, freakish kind of qualities, you know, Notre Dame at, at wide receiver has been a little bit lacking the last few seasons. And so when you can talk about, you know, guys who are under the radar, um, you know, younger guys who are already being described as freakish, I think it provides optimism for the depth that they have at the wide receiver position. You know, what's to come at the wide receiver wide receiver position. I think we're going to start to see, you know, that transition into Notre Dame having some elite wide receivers again. Yeah, Chris Tyree, it is video game level fun. Um, <laughs> Braylon James, it is long awaited and much needed that you're calling him freakish. Because like when I hear cheat code, you know, I mean, what do you think of when you hear cheat code? You think of video games, you know, like I remember like playing the, the, the Mario Brothers back in the day when, when you found the cheat code and you could get all the extra coins and all that stuff and get all the extra lives and like keep on playing. And like, I just think of, you know, like, like, like Tyreek Hill and, and Dante Hall, you know, like some of those kind of guys who you just see go out there and just do crazy things out there on the football field because of the speed. And Chris Tyree was saying today that he thinks he's gotten even faster playing, you know, just practicing so far for a few weeks at wide receiver, just because of all the running that they do, you know, like running the routes and downfield and all that stuff. And so if, if Chris Tyree is getting faster. I mean, open that cheat code, and that's going to be a lot of fun just because of the zigging and zagging and all the different things that he can do. And again, like like these three freshman receivers, how much of it we're going to get to see this year? But to hear Chancey Stuckey, you know, like start to boast and and talk about these guys and and call him Braylon James freakish. I mean, it's pretty exciting because again, like think of where this receiver room what it's looked like for the last couple of years and what it's turning into already. It's pretty exciting thinking about the next few years for him. Another fill in the blank. It's blank that incoming freshman running back Jeremiah Love run a, ran a 10-5-4 in the 100 meters last weekend. Um, it is, hmm, what is the best way to put this? It is almost Olympic-like that Jeremiah Love ran a 10.54. Like, that'll get you qualified and get you pretty far in Olympic trials. It will. <laughs> it will. <laughs> and so when you hear a time of that and you hear that he's coming into an already stacked, you know, running back room, I, I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of optimism uh, for what's coming forward. And I've used that uh, word optimism a lot, but, uh, I mean, it's the truth. I, and, and, and again, like, is is it going good enough to win you the Olympics? No, like, a, you know, it's kind of nine eights, nine nine, sub ten is what's going to get you there. But I mean, we're talking about <laughs> a senior in high school, right? So like, it's it's, it's only going to get faster the more that it, he develops in his terms of his strength um, and overall conditioning. It is elite track and field speed, is what it is. Like ten point five four in the hundred. That is just like you said. Like if. If he wanted to focus on track and think about the Olympics, he could at the very least get to the trials. And if he if he focused on it full time, he could you know probably be like that kid from Oregon a couple of years back who was wasn't there like a hurdler or something. It was yeah. you know he was like a wide receiver and ended up going to the Olympics as well. Like if he if he focused on nothing but track, he could probably find himself in the Olympics someday. So uh, it's you know again it's it's very exciting to think about this guy Jeremiah Love. Being here at Notre Dame, he's going to be on campus in June once they start showing up for summer workouts. And then where it goes from there is going to be really intriguing with this already pretty full 
Notre Dame backfield. And he's going to have to find a way. They're going to have to find a way to get him on the field somehow with that kind of speed as as a freshman, whether it's even, you know, kickoff returns, punt, re- whatever it happens to be. Got to find a way to use that speed out there. So Derek gave us this one yesterday, and I saved it for today because, you know, it's like, Vin, you know, like you're much more NFL than Vince's NFL. So I just, <laughs> I, I, I gave Vince the stiff arm. So this is an NFL question. <laughs> Do you buy or sell the NFL should hold its draft in the city that has the first pick in the draft every year? But, you know, if they trade the pick, it would still be in that initial city, even if they ultimately end up trading the pick. So if you've got the number one pick, you get to host the draft that year. I would buy it for about the first 10 years. And then after that, I would sell it because I think there's a lot of teams. You're going to get who, repeats. <laughs> you're going to get a lot of repeats, a lot of, you know, franchises that, that are kind of going through it. You know, like the Texans comes to mind. There's just there's certain teams, I think, who would never really ultimately see the chance to, to get there because they're just good run, you know, franchises like the Steelers. A bad year for them is like one game under 500 or I mean, Tomlin has never gone under 500. So it's like they would ultimately never probably get there. Mm -hmm. Um, And just, you know, thinking of like the Patriots, for example, I don't think that they would ever be bad. And and considering how long Tom Brady was there, they they weren't ever going to, you know, sniff that first overall pick. So again, I think it would be cool like the first five to 10 years because not every team is the worst every year. Um, (laughs) But it's just, I think that not enough teams would get the opportunity. Like I like the concept overall, It's just not, I don't think everyone would get their chance ultimately. Yeah, I think it's an interesting idea because at the very least it would give, you know, like you just had the worst record in the NFL. That's why you've got the number one pick. So it would at the very least give that city, you know, like even though you just had the worst record in the league, it'd be like, hey, here's a little excitement. You know, you still get to host the draft this year. So there's still going to be some buzz in your city, you know, even if it's just for this year, but like I said, or, you know, like, like you said, there would have to be a rule on like, they could only host it like maybe every five years or something like hard knock rules. Yeah, exactly. Like you can't have it, you know, more than, than, than X amount of times in, in whatever window, because like you could also see it going the other direction, like the team that wins the super bowl, you know, would, would get, to host potentially what if you Leon, did it like a, a switch reward. off every year that the, the worst team got it and then the next year the super bowl winner got it and then the next year the worst team i think that would be actually really fun because you would see a lot more balance of you know new cities because i mean let's face it, it, it not i mean i off the top of my head i don't know how many back-to-back super bowl winners there are but it's not many um, and often than not, you know, it's not the same worst team every year. It might be well, the same kind of group of worst teams, um, but it, it's still generally not the same. The best isn't the best repeat a lot. And I don't think that the worst repeat a lot. See, and here's what's funny. Like, like Derek says, biased, you just want Dallas to get it. Well, here's the thing, Dallas, you know, Dallas, <laughs> here's, here's the thing about Dallas right now. They're, you know, like knock on wood, they're, they're not going to have the number one pick, but they're also not going to win the Super Bowl, you know? So, like, so they're they never always get sitting it. there in the middle somewhere. So, they never get anything. But, they, like, you could also throw, because they've talked about moving the uh, the combine around at some point in the future. So, like, you could, you know, you could do first and last between the Super Bowl winner and whoever ends up with the number one pick. You know, like, between those two, like, one gets the combine, one gets the draft, you know, something like that. You know, but again mixing it up a little bit but you, you still need to find a way to mix it up because there would be some repeats in there you don't you you still want to keep the same cities from having things all the time but i think it's an interesting idea for sure fill in the blank jalen hurts became the highest played paid player in nfl history this week and it's blank that his agent nicole lynn landed hurts as a client by initially sending him an instagram dm it's very 2023 that she landed uh, Jalen Hurts via DM. I think that that's a lot of kind of how today's world is. It's just kind of shooting your shot, you know, floating someone a message, floating someone a DM. And, I mean, what's the worst that they're going to say? No. And, I mean, they 
you already you, you didn't have the opportunity beforehand and if you don't get the opportunity afterhand after you know throwing kind of a lob up there i mean it's not the end of the world so i think it's a, a very kind of like 2023 trend um that that that, that happened and then you know, I'm just going to sneak in a quick little thing here, obviously, because, you know, I can't I can't not when it comes to the Philadelphia Eagles and Jalen Hurts. <laughs> I just think it's to me. I think this is going to benefit the Cowboys in the long term because I think they paid a guy a lot of money off of just one year and a very good roster. Um, and I, I just hope it blows up in their face because that's a lot of money to give someone off of one year of. Uh, resume and again a roster that was really really good that benefited him a lot. I do agree with that because like just looking at that this is the same organization that Carson Wentz had one good year and they gave Carson Wentz a big contract. Right. And where did that get him? Same organization, same front office. Now Jalen Hurts is a different guy. And, you know, you're right. We, you know, we do kind of look at it a little bit differently as fans of a team in the same division, but like it's one good year and to go all in on that short sample size. And as we've talked about before, that style of quarterback, the guy who runs is also the guy whose career tends to end up being cut short because of all the hits that they take as right. well. So that's a lot of money to be paying. You know, he's still young. He's only what, like 24 or something like that. But right. And I think that that's a lot of money the only to throw benefit, at him this quick. The only benefit of paying him is you just got to get it out of the way. So like that's getting it out of the way is great. And I think they did a good job before some of these other kind of big name quarterbacks, Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, kind of get their contracts finalized because those these newer contracts for Burrow, uh, Lamar, they're they're only going to maybe be even more so that the, the Kudos to them for getting it off the books. Yes. <laughs> Fight Eagle on the road to bankruptcy. Good one, Josh. <laughs> okay, so Golden State forward Draymond Green. He's been suspended a game for the stomp of Sacramento's DeMontis Sabonis after Sabonis grabbed his leg. Fair or foul, Sabonis that also was not suspended in this whole deal. 100% fair. Uh, Sabonis doesn't oh have a God. track record of, you know, prior incidents. And I believe that's ultimately what got Draymond suspended is the stomp. And, you know, he's kicked people in the nuts before in playoff games. He's, you know, gotten loud with referees. He's after, after getting let me his, ask you this. You you know, you let me finish actually, first. Do you let think me it was actually first. the stomp or all the stuff that came after that the was stomp? going to be my next point is he okay. didn't help himself by interacting with the rest, the Sacramento crowd. Draymond never does anything to help himself out in these situations. He's got a track record and he can never just shut his mouth and let the, and take things as they come to him. So like, is it, is it a, a cheap play? What Sabonis did? Sure. But I think that the refs handled what he did, you know, he doesn't have a prior history. You know, he doesn't have a history of doing matter, these bad things. I don't think it should matter. I, I think it should only be, you know, like, why does the NBA feel the need to suspend people all the time? Isn't it enough to get a technical foul and get kicked out of the game that you're playing in? Why do you have to have another suspension after the fact? And, you know, and why wasn't Sabonis assessed anything? Because he did great. It was literally like a pro wrestling move out there. And it's like the whole thing is like pro wrestling and you know Draymond Green gives everybody a villain to watch and and Sabonis like you say he doesn't have a track record but I've heard that it, you know like I don't watch it as closely I, I've heard that he can be you know a little loose with some of his actions you know kind of punky type stuff <laughs> you know trying to draw some of this kind of thing I mean as well I don't so think I just, anyone should I just be think suspended. the NBA goes overboard with all these suspensions that they level out and I find what I find completely ironic about this whole thing is that Joe Dumars, of all people, you didn't grow <laughs> up that. watching Joe Dumars. No, he's a part of the bad boys. He was a part of the bad boys. And, like and he the had a hand in the Detroit, suspension. <laughs> the stuff that the Detroit Pistons, those bad boys Pistons were doing, like they did stuff 10 times worse than any of this, and none of them ever got thrown out of a game. It's like you just, you clock a guy, you know, maybe you get a personal foul <laughs> called on you. You know, like. Like, you know, you were talking about a, a you know, like a, a shot to the nuts. It's like, okay, hello, Bill Lambeer, you know, and, and, and Rick Mahorn and, and that whole crew. And the fact, so the fact that Joe Dumars was a charge 
of assessing this just makes me laugh hysterically because I agree bad boys that Pistons no one never got be, assessed anything. No one should be suspended, but if someone's getting suspended, it should be Draymond. Full disclosure, Draymond is my least favorite player in the NBA. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. You hate the Warriors and especially Draymond Green. This is so, correct. I just I just feel like, you know, I guess it's kind of the old adage that it's always the guy who reacts that, you know, that kind of ends up being the one who gets the penalty or whatever. But Sabonis literally is grabbing him by the leg, which, you know, is the whole reason that he ended up getting stomped on to begin with, and he got nothing out of this. Okay, so Major League Baseball is being praised for all these rules changes that they've made this season. And now they're going to experiment with some more this summer in the Atlantic League, which is basically their test league. It's like their laboratory for all the rules that uh, they want to try out. One of them is a designated pinch runner. It allows a player who's not in the starting lineup to be used at any point of the game as a substitute base runner. The player who was subbed out as well as the pinch runner would still be able to return to the game. Now there's two more. We'll go through these one at a time. So let's, let's start with this designated pinch runner. You buy it or sell it. I'm selling it. I think, you know, I get that they want to create more action and more pace in the game, but like this isn't little league anymore. I think that if you're in the MLB, a part of your five tool kind of toolbox involves having, you know, some good speed. And I don't think that you should just be allowed to sub in a faster guy at, you know, at, at random, essentially. I think that your starters are your starters. And if you want to pinch run for someone, you got to burn one of your starters. I, you know, I've liked a lot of these rules that they've done so far. Um, but this one, I, I'm really not a fan of, because again, I think that in order to make it to the MLB, just like any other sport, like it, your speed is built into that. Like you have to have good speed if you want to be right. a starter in the MLB. It's part of strategy. Like if you have a slow running catcher at first base, you've got to make a decision. Do I want to pinch run for him or do I want to keep him out there? And, you know, like a lot of times the, the, you know, the, the situation, how many outs, who's at the plate, all these different things, you know, what the score is, they all come into play and it's a big part of strategy. And I don't think that you should get rid of that. I, I, I so I sell this one as well. You know, I, you, you're absolutely right. This is like little league, high school, you know, like the courtesy runners. It's exactly what it is. It's the courtesy runner for the pitcher catcher that you have like at the high school level and below. And I, I don't think that they should do this at all. I'm not a fan of this. I I guess, you know, again, they'll experiment with it and see what happens. Another rule change they're looking at the double hook designated hitter rule. It allows a team to use a DH throughout the game As long as the starting pitcher throws at least five innings, if that doesn't happen, the team loses the DH and the pitcher spot would bat for the remainder of the game. So basically you start with a DH, but if your pitcher doesn't go at least five innings, you lose the DH Buy or sell that one. I'm also a sell on this one. I don't think that, I mean, there's times where as a starter, you just, you're, maybe your stuff is flat that day and you get rocked and give up, you know, three, four, five runs in the first two innings. I don't think you should be penalized for your starter getting rocked and the, the fact that he's got to come out kind of early and then you lose um, the DH overall. So and this basically is just saying if you can get a quality start out of your pitcher, then you get to also keep your DH. Well, no one wants a bad start out of their starting pitcher and then no one wants to lose their DH um, because of it. You're taking a bat out of the lineup on top of, you know, probably already being down if your pitcher's got to come out. You know, so you're going to be down a decent amount of runs and you're down a hitter, essentially, by the time the fifth inning rolls around. So I'm a sell on this one as well. And you've already, you know, they they just instituted the universal DH. (laughs) Why would you want to go backwards on it? You know, like, why would you want to? Right. It feels like you're undoing something that we finally were able to accomplish getting the universal DH. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm I'm with you there. They went to the universal DH so that you didn't have pitchers hitting. And now you're going to have relief pitchers hitting in that spot, <laughs> potentially. So, Even worse, because if you yeah. know starters will take batting practice because they or they used to because you knew as a starter you're going to have to get some at bats in if you were in the NL. But like, you know, relief pitchers are like, oh, I might even pitch today. So like, why would I even go out there and take at bats? Like you would see worse at bats having to see some of those relievers go up there and take some hacks. Absolutely. 
There's also a single disengagement rule, which means pitchers can only take their foot off the rubber once per at bat to attempt to pick off or reset the pitch clock. I am three for three on cells today. I think yeah. that again, once if you only get one disengagement, then what's stopping that runner from getting a huge lead right. and just taking off? Like, yeah, I, I get it. Again, you're trying to create more stolen bases, more action, more you know, moving of the game. But I, I think two is I thought two was actually uh, you know per at batter was kind of small to begin with. I think I would be more comfortable with three, and then to go down to one, I think that's just too extreme. For yeah. me, I think that the, the runner would just get too big of an of an advantage because literally all you'd have to do as a runner is just get a moderately big lead, make the pitcher have to throw over, and then after that you can get an even bigger lead and probably end up stealing unless you right. get caught in a rundown. Make, because if yeah. he steps off and you're make not him stealing, use the step offs. yeah. If you if he step if you get a big lead after he's already picked off once, um, and, and you force him to step off, but he doesn't, and, and you're not stealing, well, then you're going to get the base free automatically because he's already stepped off more than one time. Exactly. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree with all of that. Josh says he's a Warriors fan, grew up in the Jordan era. Draymond reminds him of Dennis Rodman. There's, I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of Rodman. In Draymond, I, I Draymond would say reminds that me sure. of a trash can outside that I put all my trash in. <laughs> I just don't understand, like why Draymond everyone... wouldn't be good if he was not in this exact situation, right? With the like, Warriors, you're a grown man. Your team is in the playoffs. Like, have you not been down this same road? You know how many times now? At some point, you need to learn. From just cool what, it what's already happened and you're that. already That's down oh right. two like this is a Keep pivotal game in the series not having someone like draymond green able to rebound and move the ball around to their shooters like it's it's just to me say what you want I, it, it, whether he should got to the suspension or not but it's just selfless play he's a selfish player at the end of the day and i don't think he's he considers the full picture uh more more so than often but i don't want to get stuck on that tangent again <laughs> Did you watch any of the uh, Cavs Knicks game last night? So actually, <laughs> I had to miss uh, about until halftime because yours truly made his YMCA basketball league debut last night. So <laughs> I was uh, getting some How'd running myself. Were you were you the Draymond Green of your <laughs> YMCA? <laughs> I was. Uh, I had. I had. What did I have? I had six points, few rebounds, couple steals couple assists, um, and some very winded lungs and legs by the time the game was over. I forgot. I say no pulled what muscles. It, <laughs> it, it was – I we were all pretty gassed by the end of the game. I forgot what it takes to kind of, you know, run up and down the court in, in a, a full game of basketball like that. But it was a lot right. of fun, good conditioning, um, one, one for two at the free throw line, hit a nice deep three, uh, hit a nice uh, – I actually, I think the highlight of my, my day was – I, it was a three on one and a fast break, me being the one, and I got a, I got a stop, and then I took it down full court and got a layup. So that was wasn't, that was pretty wasn't fun. A cherry, wasn't a cherry pick situation. No, I had to take again. I had to take three guys on one, got the stop, <laughs> got the rebound, and then took it down the court myself. Yeah, so a little spin move at the end. Yeah, not, not a lot of spin games in my repertoire. All right, all right, all right. Good stuff tonight. Appreciate all the questions. Tonight, as always, it is almost Blue Gold time. Two more shows, and then we're Blue Gold Saturday, baby. Well, enjoy your trip to Atlanta, Jess. Hopefully everything goes well. Safe travels, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Smash the like button on your way out. And, of course, subscribe, rate, and review to help out the Irish Breakdown podcast channels. And we will talk to you tomorrow on Ivy Nation Sports Talk.